Welcome to the Worm Farming Presentation 2.0. And this is the ultimate uh, worm farming presentation. It is the highlights of highlights of highlights of a lot of things that I've written, probably over a thousand pages of, of papers that I've written. And uh, the reason why it is so meaty and rich and full of content, because that's me as a teacher, and I don't do little teaser videos. I might do some teaser videos uh, here and there, but the reason why it's so full of information is because this will, is also a presentation for you that you will be able to purchase and you will be able to edit and uh, remove things or keep things as is. Okay, so uh, stay tuned towards the end of the video. I'll have more information that, on that and the link will be below on how you can purchase the same presentation that I'm giving to you right now. So if you are a, a worm composter, a gardener, uh, sustainable living, all of that, watch the whole video, see what applies to you, and then see what doesn't. And then at the end, uh, at some point, there will be a video that you can purchase uh, this same presentation and download it for yourself to edit. And there's a big book that goes along with it. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right. Thank you. Even fall asleep to your favorite uh, podcast like we all do at night. Or get a favorite beverage, or just watch and learn something new. Hello everyone and welcome to the Worm Farming Presentation. Uh, presented by me, Polly Picciarello. And it is... Uh, probably a presentation like you've never seen before, but it is uh, the knowledge of the past infused with the technology of today to sustain a healthier tomorrow. Welcome to Worm Composting. This is 2023 and you see my little sidekick here, Hermie. We are going to be presenting this presentation like uh, 2023 and, and you'll be able to use it in many many ways because we're, we're going to be dis discussing not just worms but we're going to be discussing several um, things related to gardening composting recycling all kinds of stuff so uh, yes if you're into worms this is totally a worm farming presentation and we will discuss the many things behind the knowledge the technology for a healthier tomorrow okay so a little bit about me for those that don't know. In the beginning, it was years and years and years ago, I failed with chemical fertilizers. I researched a better and natural method, and I discovered worm farming. I gave it a try, and immediately, I was successful. Immediately, I mean, I would say almost overnight. You know, So I had to tell people, so I started a website back in 2010, <clears throat> And you know that a good product, once you stumble upon a good product, it doesn't just affect you, but it affects everyone around them. That is a great product. And um, so it, over here you can see uh, the presentation I gave. Now this is, isn't really, you know, the, the presentation that, I give to people this is just a demo here but you know worm far farming basically it's a little outdated but you know you see here in, in 2016 uh, but in 2020 it actually was at an all-time high and now in 2023 it is really at an all-time high because of the recent scenarios that we've been uh, experiencing um, so one thing I want to stress is that uh, I don't hold any degrees at all. I don't hold any degrees in, uh, you know, horticulture or agriculture or anything else. I am just self-taught. I'm, you know, just got my hands dirty and my many failures were my lessons. Okay, so 
What is worm farming or worm culturing? Well, worm equals vermi in Latin, so that's why it's called vermiculture. And this is the artificial rearing or cultivation of worms for a specific purpose. Many worms in various species are raised for bait, food, pets, school projects, waste management, and my personal favorite is harnessing their excrement, excrement for many, many different reasons. What is worm composting or vermicomposting? Well, worm composting is the process of using worms, often red wigglers, or Icenia fetida is, is the Latin, to consume dead vegetation and turn it into a rich soil amendment. Vermicompost can contain not only worms, but the bedding materials, the organic waste, the microorganisms, and the worm castings themselves. So there is a difference between worm farming and worm composting. And let me back up to that, because I, I, and I'll explain this a little bit later in the presentation. But worm farming is you are raising worms for a specific purpose, and you're going to have a byproduct of that, which is uh, the castings. Well, if you're worm composting, which is the uh, compost aspect of it, you're going to have a byproduct of that, which is more worms. So they both kind of go hand in hand. And a lot of us professionals will use it, worm composting, worm farming, uh, vermicomposting, vermiculture, ver you know, the list goes on. But <clears throat> we kind of use it synonymously with uh, each other because uh, it just, it almost means the same thing, but it is a little more technical. And this is the technical aspect of it. And, in its definition. So what is so special about worm castings? Worm castings is the excreted substance cast out of the posterior end of the worm. And this is a great statistic I like to ask everybody and that who has heard of worm castings used as an amendment for their soil to grow plants. Well, most of us have, not all of us use it. And sometimes when I use, when I present this to people, the, you know, a lot of people raise their hands and they say, yeah, yeah, I've heard it. You know, I've heard of it, you know, but I just don't, I, I don't use it, but I've heard of it. And I heard a lot of people say a lot of good things about it. And then I ask them why. And it's, you know, chemicals are just easier, some say, especially on ornamentals. You know, it's just because you're not eating it, so people will put it on their ornamentals. But, you know, when you're eating it, that's a completely different ball game. You know, uh, bullet point number three, um, what is in worm casting? It, it contains microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, which is represented representative over here with our um, microbes. And then over here, in this next picture, where they basically are, are superheroes of the soil. So microbes are to plants what breast milk is to nursing babies. It is plants. It is a plant's natural food source. Castings are very low in NPK ratios, like, you know, in the NPK ratio of 211, 311, 321, etc., etc., okay? And I can go into this later, but um, there's, a, there's a reason why that it's very low. It's because when we're talking about a, a natural source like microbes, what's in the soil, we're not talking very high amounts of NPK because that has to do with chemicals. And when you're using chemicals, that's what you want because chemicals don't Plants don't depend on the soil's microbes. They're depending on the chemicals. So the synthetic chemicals have to have a higher ratio because that is going to sustain them throughout the rest of the growing season. So they need those high NPK ratios. And it's not just NPK. It's a lot of other types of minerals 
uh, that the plant would be feeding on, which we'll get into that later as well. So for those of us that have grown up with um, the NPK ratios and using chemicals, that is baggage. That is baggage that you have to just set aside. And if you're, you're new at this and you've not understood what soil is, then you're in for a, a huge awakening because we're not looking for high NPK ratios. Not that you can't get worm castings up higher. Um, it's just that you're trying to get the right kinds of microbes in the soil and then nature basically takes care of the rest as long as other elements or variables are met. Okay, so we're not stimulating or treating our plants through chemical fertilizers, but we are feeding them. And that is the big, that is the big difference between chemicals and soil or, you know, the difference between dirt and soil is dirt is a lack of life and soil is full of life. A lot of people like to use the word regeneration. But I use the term a living soil because that's what it is. Our bodies are living. Our bodies are constantly, uh, our cells are constantly being uh, renewed and replaced. And that is, that is, we are living tissue. And that's what soil is. Soil is a living organism. So, here is a look at real beneficial microbes. We have fungi in the first pick. That is a little uh, filament right there of uh, mycelium. And it is a tube that uh, goes throughout the soil and it feeds on carbon. And it consumes it and it's like a, like a straw and it just brings in, uh, if your plant is up here, let's say, to the northern part, it's feeding off of, you know, maybe not just microbes, but, you know, the, the carbon, like the dead leaves and the, the wood that's decaying. It taps into all of that and then just, and even the moisture, and it just starts uh, through photosynthesis of the plant. It starts to, it grabs onto the plant and they and they kind of shake hands, which you'll see in another picture. But they kind of shake hands, and the roots grow into the uh, filament, and then they uh, basically uh, kind of feed each other. And so the nutrients and the moisture, the water, run up into the roots and up into the plant, and it gets its nutrients. Now the protozoa. This is a picture of protozoa. They have a big role to play within the soil and they feed on bacteria, they feed on other protozoa, and they feed on um, just anything that they can kind of fit in their mouth, but they're very essential and uh, just play a real big part in uh, feeding even other creatures like over here is uh, the nematode. And uh, the nematode, <clears throat> basically, uh, I think this is the posterior end, but uh, it has a long digest, digest, excuse me, digestive tract, and it will feed on. Um, it can feed on protozoa, and it can feed on uh, bacteria, and bacteria is basically the bottom of the food chain. You know, we, we can't forget about the single-celled bacterium, of course. You know, this is, this is our, basically our hero of heroes here, who, um, in our screenplay, The Beneficials, is uh, Bob. He's Bacteria Bob. And um, everybody... From mycelium, excuse me, from uh, fungi to, to protozoa to nematodes, they feed on bacteria. He's just a, the bottom of the food chain. So, um, and that's very important when understanding soil and 
uh, and act actually brewing or making tea, and we'll get into that later as well. So the difference between, you know, nature versus uh, science and bad science is what I like to call it. But man's vicious cycle of chemical fertilizers is synthetics are made from oil, gas, or fossil fuels. Farmers put it in and on their soil and their crops, and we eat chemically fertilized crops, especially the ones designed to kill weeds and pests. And that's one thing I want to really point out is that chemical fertilizers are one thing, but the, the other chemicals that are invented are designed to kill, and that is whether it's a fungicide like, or an herbicide or a pesticide, they are designed to kill organisms, and we are also ingesting that, and that can't be good for our immune system. And our immune system, when we eat certain foods that are grown from big agriculture and they spray this, this stuff, we're, you know, we're getting it too. Now, if it was just a chemical fertilizer, we would probably see a little bit of difference in all the kinds of different diseases that we have within the human body. Okay, and I want to preface this, this whole presentation like I did already, is that I hold no degree. So all of this is my opinion, and it's what I have just come to the conclusion, you know, with being out in the field and growing and having failures and having successes. And, you know, I've been growing food and medicine for uh, almost 20 years. So uh, I've been, I, I, I've had my, my moments and which is why I've written so many things and shared so many things with you. But uh, we've got to understand that, you know, nature knows better than what man does. Okay, so uh, these chemicals that are created, they're designed to kill. And we don't even know what they're doing to our bodies, okay, because the science is still out there. It's, it's not really, um, it's not really known for sure what everything is doing to us because we have so many organs and so many different chemicals out there that our bodies depend on and are we are we hurting our organs or are we uh, helping our organs through uh, certain processes and and how we eat and what our diet is so um, let me back up because we eat chemical fertilized crops especially ones that are designed to uh, kill weeds and pests, and uh, we get sick either now or eventually, and then we see the doctor. He prescribes medicines made from chemicals again, and uh, chemicals have side effects. So the doctor prescribes more meds, and then we eventually end up in the hospital where they finally correct our medications only to send us home and then soap, rinse, and repeat on and on and on. And one thing that uh, I like to always kind of point out is that our bodies are very complicated and sometimes... Um, like if we, if we go on a medication, and I'll say this right out, that I am not against pharmaceutical, everything that's pharmaceutical, anything that comes from pharmaceuticals, because there's, there's good science and then there's bad science. And science means knowledge. And if we apply knowledge in the way that we can ethically apply it, then that is very beneficial for us and for nature. And once we get away from that and we just, you know, well, let's just put some chemicals in there and see what the plant does. Oh, wow, the plant seems to do very, very great. 
So it must be an awesome looking plant, as you see in this picture over here. The plant looks, you know, very healthy, you know, very strong. And Hermie here is looking at the plant and he's like, I know a better way. I can help you. And he's sick. You know, our plants are very healthy. They look healthy. Excuse me. They look healthy. They look very delicious. But, you know, tomatoes you get from the store, they look good. But, they, you know, it tastes like cardboard. And even some of the produce, they're small and, you know, they're not very tasty. You know, and then you look at him and, and he's uh, actually uh, sick. Our, our bodies are extremely complicated yet simple, right? Nature is complicated yet simple. The soil is complicated yet simple. And when something like in our bodies, our gut, that's our engine, and when something goes wrong, let's say uh, if we equate it to a car and something's wrong with the engine and a cog goes out, then what happens is, well, you know, it's not firing on all cylinders or something. And so the doctor's like, great, I got a pill for that. So we take a pill and that cog is removed and a synthetic cog is put in place. Well, the cog functions as like it's supposed to, but it doesn't quite work well with the rest of the team. It doesn't quite work well with others. So, you know, that tends to get some of the other cogs not functioning very well either. So now there's side effects, negative side effects. So it's like, got these side effects, and like, no problem, we'll work on that. I've got, we'll, we'll put you on some other medication for that so we get on other medications and now that cog is placed replaced with another synthetic cog and then uh, now we've got two cogs that are starting to really throw a monkey wrench into the whole system and then it uh, I've, I've seen people that are on so many medications it's like let's just you know, completely get you off and go back to the ones that you actually really need. You know, and this is this is where this is where we need to start getting back to, but it's gotten way out of control. And if we could just go back to what how nature you know, there's there's so many types of of good foods and medicines, and I always say that food is medicine. And that's what we have to get back to. Uh, and then our bodies will eventually heal. So, I mean, this is a case-by-case -case scenario. So this is, this is nothing that I would ever say as a blanket statement. Okay, so there's so many variables. But when we can get the right food in our system and get our bodies back to being healthy, we have a completely different uh, approach and our bodies will eventually heal again. So, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, I talk about in, in both Warren Farming Revolution book and Brown Thumb, Green Thumb, probably more in Brown Thumb, Green Thumb because that has to do a whole lot with um, growing your plants and talking a lot about the minerals. Um, so anyway, uh, on to the next slide. So that was man's, uh, that was man's vicious cycle of chemical fertilizers. Um, nature's cycle of fertilizers is a, a lot easier. So the plant dies and falls to the ground. The plant decays. The worms and others eat dead plants. Worms leave their castings in or on the ground. Plant feeds on natural rich worm castings. And then you repeat. It's been going on for thousands of years, but man has a better way than nature, right? Because man always does. He can always make it better. And we should trust in big pharma and chemical companies to know what's better for us than what was already created. And here you see a sad, sad picture. That it doesn't have to be this way. All right, so since this is the worm farming presentation, 
we're going to get to what are the types of earthworms. Well, this is, you know, entom entomology is very in-depth and science still cannot agree on the taxonomy of worms, but they're getting better at it. So the three types of worms, they're grouped into three kind of different categories or classes. And uh, one is the anisic. They're deep burrowers. They come up to feed on decaying matter, then retreat into their burrows like the common nightcrawler, such as Canadian nightcrawler. But they're, you know, they're just deep soil dwellers. They, they make drillospheres, is what I call it. The holes in the ground that's, you know, great for aeration and for water to come through. And um, got a very excellent video that I'll put down in the description so that you can watch it. These are worms everywhere in my goat yard like uh, I've never seen before. And these are, I'm in Kansas and these are Canadian night crawlers, but I've never seen worms like this before. So our second uh group here is the endogeic. They're excellent garden worms. They build lateral burrows or drillospheres and they rarely come to the surface such as the Alabama jumper. And the Alabama jumper is very, it's kind of a controversial worm, but uh, they come from the Gulf states. Not only just Alabama, but they're they're around the Gulf states, and they they're a uh, they're very meaty, very muscular. Of course, they have to be because they're like bulldozers, just going through uh, horizontally through the surface, eating uh, not just decaying matter, but uh, gulping up the uh, soil as well. Our third. One is uh, the ones that we really want to talk about, and that's the uh, epigeic, the topsoil where rich decaying matter is found, and these are composting worms. Composting worms are the best worms and the only worms to use when culturing in a container-like system, generally. Now, I'm not... There's a lot of things I'm going to say here in this presentation, and it doesn't mean that... It, that this presentation is the end-all, be-all. Uh, there will certainly be many people, uh, when I say that you shouldn't or you can't or don't, it doesn't mean that that's the end-all, be-all, because there are people out there that are successful with uh, your anisic, your endogeic um, worms being kept in a bin. I even read about a lady keeping a, I think, the Canadian Nightcrawler in her crisper drawer in the refrigerator. It's kind of weird, but we're worm farmers, right? We're all weird. <laughs> so, anyway, um, this gets us on to the topic of what is the best composting worm. Well, I cover this in great detail, more worms than this, uh, in the Worm Farming Revolution book. But it all really depends on what your needs are. It depends on the climate, the composting needs of the worm, uh, your composting needs, uh, the intended use of the worm. There's a lot of variables. Um, but the red wiggler, the, which the Latin name is Isenia fetida, uh, these are the most common. That's the most sold, and they're very docile, they're prolific and adaptive to a wide range of temperatures, and they are a very small worm. Not the best fishing worm, though some do use it, but they're not the best fishing worm. It just depends on which fish you're going for, but they're anywhere between two and four inches long. Very small. European Nightcrawler. Now, these are the cousins to the Red Wiggler. The Latin for it is Iceni Hortensis, twice as large as the Red Wiggler. They're still prolific. Um, although they don't, their cocoons don't have as many eggs in them as the red wiggler. Uh, they are less pro prolific than the reds, um, and they're adaptive to a wide range of temperatures, just like the red wigglers. And they are five to seven inches long, you know, average. And hands down, yes, the best composting fishing worm. So if you want to 
raise uh, a composting worm and harness the castings and culture the worm then and, and use it for fishing. These are great, especially in salt water. Uh, let's see. I keep going past here. Um, the blue worm. Um, the Latin for it is Perionix excavatus, or the Indonesian blue, or blue worms. They've got many different nicknames. All of these worms have several different nicknames, so you kind of have to research that. I go, I go over a lot of nicknames in the Worm Farming Revolution book. But uh, they prefer temps above 50 because they're, they're tropical worms. And they are extremely prolific, probably one of the most prolific composting worms out there. And uh, they're moody when... Sometimes when it starts to rain, all the rain, although you can kind of tame them a little bit. Depends on how your bin is set up. Some people never have a problem with them. Others, they just go ballistic for some reason uh, when the barometric pressure drops and it's about to rain. So if your elbow starts to ache, your knee starts to ache, guess what? If your worm bin isn't set up properly, you might have some worms trying to escape. And these worms are tiny. They are very tiny, two to four inches long. Some may be bigger, some may be a lot smaller too. And the African nightcrawler is another uh, tropical worm. <clears throat> Eudralis eugeni. That's the African, excuse me, the Latin term, and I like to call these worms uh, Eugene. The temps are, are, like I said, common to the blue worm between 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can be moody as well. Uh, they have a great appetite, and they're, they can get about seven inches long, or even uh, a lot longer than that. Okay, um, so that's pretty much it on your composting worms. But so let's get into the next topic, and that's what to feed composting worms. Well, we can pretty much say that anything that comes from the ground or out of the back end of, of an animal, which also eats from the ground, some manure should be pre-composted for at least two weeks before introducing it to the worms. They can be fed kitchen scraps, newspaper, junk mail, peat moss, coca coir, dead, fallen leaves, hay, straw, etc., and then minerals. And over here in our picture, um, well, above it, is our carbon to nitro nitrogen ratio, which is 10 to one, all the way up to 40 to one, 40 carbon to one nitrogen ratio. And this is one of uh, our coloring books. And in it, you can see that uh, some, you know, there's a myth out there that worms can eat their weight every day. And, you know, I've never seen it, I've never heard it, that this is true. It is a myth, but it's a funny uh, illustration here uh, because it shows this very muscular worm eating uh, quite a bit there, and the tattoo on him is 10 trip kip. <laughs> so, uh, but no, worms, they won't even eat half, although. I don't want to say that they can't because, you know, once food is in a liquid form and depends on what you feed them, who knows? Maybe it's possible they could eat their half, half their weight a day, but generally they'll eat somewhere around a quarter of their weight. It's something that is, it takes months and months of testing, maybe even years of testing. Okay, and then you have to actually prove it or try to demonstrate it in some sort of way. Um, so here is what not to feed your worms. Okay, I'm going to go through this, but it doesn't mean that you cannot use any of these things, okay? Because no matter what I say, is that somebody somewhere will say that's nonsense because I do this all the time and I can feed them leather, Hey, they eat nothing but leather. Okay, if I were to tell that to somebody like, 
you know, I've seen a video where people are throwing in meat and they're throwing in, you know, uh, a jug of milk into a, a bucket and like, there you go, boom, worms eat anything. I would have several people very upset at me and then I would have to go through a series of cleanup and trying to tell people, okay, well, you can't actually feed it to them like this, you know, because they're going to be crawling out. They're not even going to know what to do because they got so much food and it's going to rot and it's going to go anaerobic and they're going to have just a big nightmare on their hands. So why I'm saying this, what not to feed your worms is because uh, you're a beginner or you're, you may be an uh, intermediary or maybe you're a professional, but you, I, I cannot tell anybody that this is, you know, that you can feed anything. You have to understand what the parameters are and what the basic needs of a worm are. So you have to start from the, the beginning so that you know exactly Okay, if I mess up on something, I overfed on something, here's what I need to take out. Okay, so this is what every be be uh, beginner should know is that milk or dairy products should not be fed. Meat, fat, bones, leather or fur, no animal products, nothing oily or greasy substance, citric or highly acidic fruits, tomatoes are okay in moderation, spicy or hot peppers or plants, Mild and sweet peppers are okay. Onions, garlic in moderation, but this will impede the process. A lot of these things you can feed, it just, you know, some of this stuff is pungent and they're strong and they're acidic and they're salty and they're, uh, there can be a lot of things that just worms will not take to quickly. It just impedes the entire process, whether you're focusing on worms, castings, or uh, cocoons. Uh, salt, sodium, baking soda, baking powder or vinegar, hair or dryer lint, long hair can strangle worms. I've seen it myself because I even wondered, hey, can I put um, my cotton from the uh, catcher from the dryer, can I put all that stuff into the worm bin? And I've opened it up and I've seen worms almost strangled to death by hair. That's basically wrapped around them and I think I have killed a few of them so since then I just I've taken the uh, dryer lint and either done something else with it or put it out in the compost pile um, woody material and straw and plant stalks these are fine uh, there's no issue unless uh, you want to make worm castings quickly, but it's another thing that will impede the process. You want you want soft. You, you got to think soft when it comes to nitrogen, like uh, leaves, you know, fallen dead leaves or uh, shredded cardboard. You want to think soft carbon, and of course, all nitrogen is is soft. Um, but they complement each other, and it's all food for the worms, whether it's carbon or nitrogen. But um, you want to just make sh you want to keep in mind that anything that is not th that's on this list here, it could actually just impede the process. And as a beginner, you you want to get, get quick. You want to get those worms building up fast, the population building up fast, and you want to get uh, your castings built up fast, and you want to get them uh, populating your worm bin as fast as possible. Or if you're a, re a recycler, you also want to recycle the food as quick as possible. Put in your outside compost pile and feed it to the worms. I like to have inside compost bins, and then I like to have outside, because outside is great for anything that you have excess of or uh, you know that you should keep out of a worm bin. Um, so that just basically goes out to the outside compost pile where eventually something will take care of it, whether it's worms or um, insects or any other type of animal that'll process it and 
turn it into a nice compost. All right, so that's what to keep out. Let's talk about the three main sources of food. Uh, carbon, and this is in uh, the Worm Farming Revolution book. We talk a lot about this because it's, it's composting worms, and that's what the book is about. But carbons are considered your browns, and they are full of carbohydrates. Just be, but understand this, that because a food looks brown, it doesn't mean that it, it is a carbon source. Coffee is brown only because it was toasted, but it's considered a green. It's still fresh, and it still has not, <laughs> has not really died yet. It's just green and then roasted. So and carbons are your coconut coir, cocoa husks, peat moss, cardboard, paperboard, newspaper, newsprint, tissue paper, paper bags, copy paper, leaf litter, dry brown grasses, egg cartons, drink trays. These are all good sources for bedding, but the bedding is still food. Coconut coir or coconut husks, I will say, uh, this is more of a rich, rich person's type of bedding for worms um, because they're, they're not cheap. And um, it's not that you can't, they work very great, very great. Uh, peat moss works very great too. Um, there's a lot of debate about peat moss. You can decide for yourself on that. Um, but the coca coir is a lot more expensive. Okay, our, our other main source that we talked about is the nitrogen. And the nitrogen is considered our greens. So we got our browns and we got our greens. And they're full of proteins like grass or hay, albeit Grass and hay, you know, fresh is low in protein than that of grains, but once it's dried, it's considered more of a carbon source due to the nitrogen gas off. So uh, if you're going to feed it, make sure it, it is like if you just cut the lawn and you got, as you can see in this picture, if you've cut the lawn and you've got some of this stuff right here, and it's fresh grass, it can get very uh, pungent and it can go anaerobic because it'll start to compact and won't be very aerated. So only put it in a small handful if you want to feed, feed uh, grass to the worms. Um, this is great. Coffee grounds is great. And uh, kitchen scraps are great. So... Uh, but when in doubt and you're not sure, uh, I just had somebody email. I get email, emails all the time. Can I feed this? Can I feed that? It's like, you know what? I've never fed it. Doesn't mean you can't. But if humans can eat it, generally um, worms can eat it too. But worms can eat much more things than what humans can. But, you know, when in doubt, just keep it out. Okay, so nitrogen, nitrogenous material is grasses, green leaves, blades, Petals to flowers, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains, etc. Just be careful with some pine needles and poisonous plants. Um, things that are pungent and have harsh odors like walnut leaves that are high in tannins or turpentine and such as in pine needles. Uh, but just fresh grass, fruits, and veggies, you know, just keep it simple. You know, when you're first starting out, you know, or maybe you've been doing it a year, just keep it simple, really. And then you get an understanding of what the worms like, you know, even, um, well, one of their favorite foods, which isn't very juicy, but it's an avocado. They go nuts over that. You don't have to worry about it like uh, cantaloupe, cucumber, uh, watermelon. All that stuff can be very juicy. And once it starts to uh, break down, it gets everything 
uh, just goes throughout everywhere and then you get drainage, a lot of drainage, and you don't want that. You want everything to just remain moist, but we'll uh, totally get into that. Um, so another thing that we'll talk about, if I can get this slide to move, it's not moving. There we go. Another a source for food that uh, a lot of people don't talk about is minerals. Minerals are essential for nutrition and help the body with building, repairing, overall functionality and health. Minerals aid other minerals in their functions like silica. Silica helps calcium to be deposited in the body properly. And I can back this up uh, through Dr. Butenet, who proved, yes, proved, not demonstrated, but proved that life cannot exist without silica. Water and Salt, a book by Dr. Barbara Hendel in 2003, states that silica is the most important trace element in human health. And a great form of silica is diatomaceous earth. And whatever you heard about diatomaceous earth, any negativities, is not true. Because I don't ever hear this really in very many... Um, I don't watch a whole lot of YouTube videos or, you know, I'm too busy. Even get my own videos out is, is extremely difficult. But diatomaceous earth, I want you to understand, it's not like shards of glass. It doesn't come from rocks. Okay, it comes from plants. I'll put a link down below to, uh, I've got six pages on it, which is probably a, a small book. Um, but it comes from plants, and that's why it is so beneficial. And it is such a small uh, colloidal form that the body can use it very well. I even ingest the stuff. It's, it's wonderful. So uh, minerals is an inorganic material, mostly from ground rock. Uh, both my books, The Brown Thumb, Green Thumb, and The Worm Farming Revolution, talk about minerals, although as far as when it comes to worms, I, I talk about 19 different minerals uh, to either use or completely stay away from. But all life needs minerals. Worms need minerals to aid in digestion. They don't have teeth to grind their food into smaller portions. They have a gizzard. Within the gizzard, the bacteria get trapped between the stones that the Gizzard causes rub against each other like a pestle and mortar. So I can't stress enough the importance of minerals. Many plants succumb to diseases and die only because there was no presence of minerals. Like calcium. Calcium is very important for uh, plants. We all know that tomatoes do much better when you add some form of lime uh, or calcium lime. Minerals are as important as water itself. Plants will still grow and complete their life cycle even if the surrounding soil does not contain proper amounts of minerals but will remain unhealthy. And you can get minerals from so many different sources, especially if you have chickens. Here I am with my spice grinder throwing eggs in there and grinding them up into a probably 250 mesh and then I sprinkle it boom right down here into the worm bin and the worms not only benefit from it uh, like a gizzard but get nutrients from it so Minerals are food, and food is medicine, as mentioned in the books. I quote from Dr. Charles Northern, uh, who was around about 90 years ago when he came out with this, but uh, it was a speech prepared for the 74th Congress, somewhere circa 1935 to 37. And I will 
this is a very small excerpt and quote from uh, both of these books. Uh, but he said do, in, in his speech, do you know that most of us today are suffering from certain dangerous diet deficiencies which cannot be remedied until the depleted soils from which our foods come are brought into proper mineral balances. The alarming fact is that foods, fruits and vegetables and grains, now being raised on millions of acres of land that no longer contains enough of certain needed minerals are starving us, no matter how much of them we eat. 99%, he goes on to say, of American people are deficient in these minerals. And that a marked deficiency in any one of the more important minerals actually, actually results in disease. Again, this was excerpt from an article called uh, Modern Miracle Men by Rex Beach in 1936. And you can find it on the Internet Archive site. So even though our foods are fortified today, which you might see rebuttals, there's, you know, if you do enough research, you can see a rebuttal. Oh, this guy was... Maybe it applied years ago, but today farming is different. Uh, and the way that food is processed is different, is different because now they're being fortified with vitamins and minerals. We all look at, look at the cereal box and it says fortified with vitamins and minerals. Well, it's not in the proper colloidal form or proper digestion. That's my argument with that rebuttal to this um, to the speech that was given, and to those that are uh, negative towards it. So this has everything to do with worm farming. The worms and microbes will further break down the minerals, delivering max uptake in plants, and ultimately us. So just be wary of the naysayers, and you know, do your own research. But this, you know, the way our our lands are. You know, big agriculture, the way it's grown today, it's just very lacking in minerals because chemicals, chemical fertilizers, and I'm not just talking the ones that you're used to kill, but the chemical fertilizers that help plants grow, the microbes do not benefit from it. They, it's, it kills them. So... Farmers today, at big agriculture, are growing out of dirt, not soil. That's why they need the chemicals. So usually when I do a presentation and I'm in front of a group, I start building a bin. And I like to have people come up and see it and watch it. And uh, I take questions from them, but uh, we start to build a worm bin. And I tell them, I said, make sure that you understand the cool, which means proper temps. Two, dark. Three, it's got to be moist. Not wet, but moist. Uh, good ventilation and proper foods like we discussed earlier. And then, of course, privacy. Do not disturb. Okay, now. I said there are five basic principles, but you know we all love to raise the lid, or if you don't have a lid, that's fine. Uh, just like you see here, there is no lid. It's fine. You can put newsprint over this, a sheet, and the worms will never come out because it's too dry. But once you put a lid on it, guess what? All the sides become moist, and that becomes part of their environment. They'll start crawling, crawling up every, everywhere. I suggest always leaving the lid off and just, uh, unless you've got an animal around that cat or a dog that you think might get in it, then you want to put a lid on it. But um, you always want to lift that newsprint or uh, the lid just to kind of check in on them. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. I just want you to understand that privacy is important. So the less disturbance, uh, the more production you're going to have in worms, in cocoons, and uh, castings. And you can actually, 
I talk about this. It's, it's, a, it's a big article, but I talk about this um, in great detail. Matter of fact, I've even condensed it into a one-page printout, which you can go here, and you can print it out, and you can keep it next to the worm bin. You can keep it on a desk somewhere, or you can put it, slide it right under your pillow so that you can rest easy at night knowing that you've stuck with the five basic principles because this is what worms need in their natural habitat as well. So we're just trying to copy their hab habitat and we're copying success. All right. So some of the, uh, <clears throat> if you don't want to build a, a bin from things that are lying around the house, you can get a professional worm bin, which is uh, the Worm Factory. Uh, thank you to Nature's Footprint for allowing me to use these. Um, here it shows, this is, this is what's called a flow-through system. Because the worms, you, know, you put the food in at top, which would have been here, but uh, they'll turn it into castings, then they'll crawl up into what would be this right here would actually be down here and then it would turn into this and the worms would crawl up again to the new food source and then back up to the new food source again. So every month, every two months, it depends on uh, your worm, it depends on the environment and what you're feeding it. Uh, and the temperature is just like that uh, printout sheet that uh, we just discussed, but in here should be very little worms and very little cocoons. If you had were to wait, let's say three months, uh, some maybe four months, but just depends. And this is kind of like you know what it looks like here, and then this, this is another picture. But anyway, this is a great system that I still use today. I've been using it for over. I, yeah, over 10 years I've been using it. And I have a very specific reason why I use this one, and I'll get into that later. And here's another commercial worm system if you want to get one. It is uh, by the inventor Steve Churchill. Uh, him and I are great friends. Uh, he invented the urban worm bag, and this is called a continuous flow through system. The reason why it's called a continuous flow through system is because right in here in this area you have your worms and your castings and you've got some food here on top and some carbon. So here are your worms and they are eating some of the material and down here is your wonderful castings that you can open up this bottom right here just unzip it I think he's got a kind of a different design now which is a better access hatch down here but you just unzip it and out into your tray here is Nothing but great castings, okay? And this is what it looks like on the inside. And up top, I show you a picture here where it's all fully sealed. So it's a not quite a closed system because it's still not sealed up too much to where air and uh, can't move through there because your soil, uh, like your microbes and your worms and the other uh, creatures that are in there that are helping decompose everything, break everything down into compost. They need oxygen. And this system keeps moisture in, but yet it also allows it uh, to vent very well. So I actually have two of these. And I'll tell you what the purpose is for that, uh, why I have two of these and why I have uh, one worm factory as well. Um, the reason why I use these differently, there's, there's, a, there's a method behind my madness, but believe me. Uh, another one I want to get into is another commercial worm system, 
which is kind of a combo one here. It's the Garden Tower, and this is their Garden Tower 2. And the inventor is Colin Cudmore. Thank you, Colin, uh, for the use of these pictures. Um, <clears throat> also, along with environmental scientist Joel Grant and health, profession, health professional Thomas Telesti. Man, what a, what a great, what a great person. R.I.P. Thomas. Uh, but uh, he was a very true friend to the end for me and really helped with the Worm Farming Revolution book. Uh, and thanks also to Karen Christie and the rest of the team. The way that this process works is it's a composter and a planter in one. I have this, I love it, uh, and I use it just about every year. Let me go to my pen. But this turns, so when you're planting and it's outdoors or indoors, you want to be able to turn it to where uh, it gets equal amount of, of sunlight. So it is able to turn either direction. It's on ball bearings. You have a center tube here where you put your worms and your kitchen scraps and your carbon material. And you fill this up with whatever soil mix you want. Every, there's 50 plus pockets here, and this is what you get, whatever you want to plant. You, I mean, you can grow anything out of here. I don't care what it is, ornamentals, fruits, vegetables, anything. I wouldn't grow a tree, but you can grow anything you want. And uh, the worms will crawl in and out of this, and they'll leave their castings. Also, the roots will grow into the center of the uh, column <clears throat> and it is a very harmonizing uh, synergistic type of setup and when you water and water and water or it rains and it rains and it rains it comes down through this filter right here which leaves the castings and worms behind and uh, it fills up this section here where you've got water and you can pull that out and dump it right back on top or into these pockets so that you have minimal water usage. And this is just a very good system. And um, they sent me the old one. And then when they got the new one, they sent me this one, which was a huge upgrade. And I still have them both, but I like this one uh, the best. Our next, <clears throat> excuse me, our next uh, one here is uh, the subpod. Now, I don't talk about any system that I don't have personally or any product that I don't have personally. However, I will tell you that I do not have this one. And the reason is, is because I'm uh, sort of a latecomer to this. Um, but... For those who want, I mean, there, there's no reason why this concept doesn't work. I've been growing plants and composting many years enough to, I don't have to read all the testimonials. I know they've got plenty, but, you know, I know that it works. I know that it works. It, it's an in-ground worm farm. It's a composter, a recycler, and a plant feeder. And... Because um, it's a lot different than the garden tower. The garden tower is above ground. This is in ground. You don't grow plants directly out of it, although some people probably do. But your worms are kept in here, and you can see the holes for ventilation, and the worms go in and out. And you can close the lid and then, you know, you've got plenty of airflow. It all turns to castings. You can pull those castings out and you can, you can put them around here into your plants or you can use them somewhere else. But even if you don't, like let's say this may be a little overkill for this size of raised bed, 
you're using it for a recycler. So you're recycling your, your kitchen waste and it's not going to a landfill somewhere. You know, and you can use it, uh, you can pull your castings out and you can give it to friends and you can use your castings for other things. Uh, you can use castings uh, in your garden and in your, uh, your greenhouses. And there are just so many different uses. So for those that uh, like the garden tower and, and for the sub pod, you can use uh, this in your apartments and in just small spaces, you know, where you're trying to grow something, you know, and I always tell people, it's like, man, just work with what you have. And so many people that's like, they just talk and they don't ever do anything. It's like, just start doing something. And the, these are two great uh, products to start out with when you're, you want to get a commercial system and you want to start growing something. Okay, so our next topic is using the castings. Well, now that you got, you've been doing it a while and you got plenty of uh, castings, how do we use them? Well, we're going to mix them in certain percentages for seeds, seedlings, and your transplants. And what I've always done is uh, I've kind of stuck with, uh, you know, a 25% or used in quarters. Um, my castings would be 25% or less uh, which is great to use because the castings, um, not only are they alive because they're microbes, they don't want to die, but uh, they're great for nutrients and great for moisture retention. And the reason why is because they're a living organism and they are plant food. That's, you know, they don't want to die, but you never want them to die or dry up because then it sets up like a brick. Then it's not useful. You could grind it up and it could become nutrients, but that's not the point. You want them to stay down into the soil and uh, keep them moist. Another thing that you could uh, mix it up with would be a traditional compost maybe from an outside compost pile or maybe you have a compost tumbler um, potting soil uh, that's kind of tricky you know but some people don't have access or can't make their can't make their own potting soil so they go out and they buy potting soil please be careful with that um, it's not always necessary, but potting soil, you, don't, you never know what you're going to get. Um, I don't, personally, I don't mix with potting soil. I'll either mix with uh, garden soil or uh, maybe a little bit of peat moss, but usually I've got plenty of um, compost piles to take from and garden soil to take from and then use my uh, worm castings. Uh, you can also mix with um, leaf, hay litter, dead grass, or coca coir, and you know, another 25%. Uh, your other 25% can also be garden soil, like we mentioned, and sand, or both. Sand is also good for, you know, the drainage, uh, and for some minerals. You know, sand isn't the best source for minerals. Green sand is better but it's not the best source of minerals. But of course you also want to, whoops, you also want to mix it with uh, plenty of minerals. That's also needs to be in your mix. Here you have all my different uh, mixes here that I've used. And I do have a video that explains that about mixing you know, all the different types of soil mixes. And these are our worm castings here. These are worm castings and worm castings. All right. And these are the results that you get from castings. You, castings are nutrient dense and um, depends, also depends on how fresh they are. I like to use extremely fresh castings. Uh, 
but that's a good question. How fresh are the castings? You know, if I pull straight from the a worm factory or, or an urban worm bag, uh, you could even pull from a sub pod. Um, but depending on what it looks like and how it smells, if, if it smells nice and earthy, I like to use it about a month as long as it looks good and there will still be some particles in there but if it if it looks like castings and it smells great and it's a month you're good that's about as fresh as it gets and it will help you pr to produce the nutrient dense healthy food and medicine and these are just some picks from my garden all right so not only can we produce worm castings, but we can also produce worm tea. <clears throat> so we also have to def define what is worm tea. Worm tea is not the liquid that collects at the bottom of a worm system. Worm tea is now becoming synonymous with aerated worm tea. And I'll talk more about that later. What's at the bottom of the worm bin is called leachate just like at a landfill. It's the pool of liquid at the bottom. It can contain some unbeneficial microbes that are not plant food. Leachate has the potential to make your plants sick or dead. Some people will tell you it's okay to use leachate and some do have good benefits from it. However, not all leachate is created equal. Okay? Not all leachate is created equal. That's very important. If it has a bad smell or an off smell, you do not want to use it. And in a worm bin, you should never be getting the liquid runoff. Okay, there's different reasons why that maybe some people will. Uh, but this is not worm tea, okay? This is, this is a no-no. And this here is a no-no. <laughs> this was only meant as a joke. Okay, you don't, you don't want this stuff. It can have pathogens. And it can have things that will actually just kill your plants. I've seen it personally, and it's happened to me personally. You pour that on them, boom, the next day your plant's dead. So uh, there can be a time to use it and a time not to use it. Okay, so like I said in... The beginning of this you know everybody's different and they will argue with me oh uh, yeah you can but i can't just tell people yeah i use it because i'll have a lot of hate mail because they'll be mad at me because it killed their plants well that's the reason why because the difference between leachate and worm tea is that leachate is the liquid runoff that settles at or below the vermicompost or worm castings this is a form of seeping and worm tea is the product or end result of suspending worm castings for extracting in highly oxygenated water. This is a form of steeping. Right here you see this bag. That is a form of steeping. This is the leachate. Too much uh, kitchen scraps or maybe fruity scraps that you've put in there and now it's settled down to the bottom here and now you got to drain it off because you got worms coming down in here and they're dying they're drowning because this water is not aerated and I don't even suggest aerating leachate so just if you get any strain it you really shouldn't have one of these taps anyway but I say for beginners go ahead because there's a learning curve and you Sometimes, you, you know, you, you need it until you get to the point where it's like, okay, I, I think I know how to feed my worms regularly and what types of food to feed them so that uh, I don't get all that liquid runoff. And if you have way too much liquid and it's too wet, your system's not going, going to be aerobic. It's going to be anaerobic and you, you're going to get pathogens and uh, the unbeneficial microbes start to grow. So if you noticed, not only do these words have two different meanings, but they are entirely two different processes. One is seeping, 
and the other is steeping, in which one can only occur, occur by human intervention. Worm tea should probably be referred to as aerated worm tea, if this is how it's made. We'll get into another form of how to make tea. Uh, as you can see here, though, in this pick, we have a simple pump and bucket setup. And this is what I used for several years, uh, even when you saw some of the produce uh, earlier that I showed you, my, my garden. This was from just this, a simple pump and bucket setup. That's really all you need. So creating worm tea. Worm tea is created by suspending a porous bag of worm castings, like seen here. <clears throat> and seen here. Or you can simply just dump the castings into a container of chemical-free water. So you don't even need the bag if you don't want to use it, as long as you've got plenty of agitating water or aerated bubbling water to move your castings around because if you just dump your castings in here if you don't have enough movement it's just going to sit down here at the bottom and you there can, there can be dead zones uh, which are called anaerobic zones and here you can get uh, unbeneficial microbes that will start to populate so adding molasses which is a food source to the water as a catalyst to stimulate growth is what you need and installing an air pumping system to increase an aerobic, highly oxygenated environment for the inoculation of the microorganisms. Worm tea is beneficial in so many ways from the root all the way up to the tips of the leaves. So this is my current setup for 2023, right here. So I can bubble in one, I can bubble in this one, and then, uh, after 24 to 36 hours, I can use the bubbling from this, which is just regular water, and I can combine these and make it stretch to 64 gallons. Because, you know, with this system, you can dilute it. You can dilute it as much as you want, even up to 50 gallons. But if you have... A whole lot of watering to do then you want a bigger system and I tea like crazy I I brew it and tea it constantly throughout the summer and you'll see in some of my picks why I do that make sure that you have an adequate pump um, this one this is a little pump that is not really used uh, sometimes I use it, to use it depends on how, uh, how much bubbling I want. But this uh, 1,750 gallon per hour pump, it's just air. It will do you perfect. And you can, it's strong enough to where you can set, uh, this is an atomizer I bought. I've got two of those. It goes down, it goes into a, a circle, and then I've put holes in it on the top and on the bottom and the reason why on the bottom is so that anything that uh, settles down to the bottom it'll shoot that air out and bring it back up to the top so there's no dead zones alright so and this is never <laughs> some say oh is that overkill uh, no that's not you can never overkill you can never over uh, create worm tea you can never over brew you can never apply it the only way you could harm your plants is if you didn't brew it properly or if you're watering too much and it's like maybe my plants are dying because I'm putting too much water on it that is the only reason they're just microbes that's all it is it's just plant food it's not like your average uh, like your chemical fertilizers, which will burn plants. So the benefits of worm tea. Okay, worm tea contains all the helpful microorganisms that are found in worm castings like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. 
So what's the purpose of brewing the worm tea? Kind of like I just explain, explained, but this is what's different about worm farming and then uh, brewing worm tea, because now you are microbe farming. You speed up the growth rate of microbes in order to multiply their numbers exponentially so they may be delivered to the plant in a more rapid, absorb, absorptive liquid state. Castings are a solid, time-release process. However, like taking supplements in a liquid form, the plants receive nutrients in a liquid form for faster uptake. So when poured on the soil, not only is the plant fed, but the soil also increases in beneficial microbes. This crowds out the bad microbes where there are just too many beneficial microbes to, complete, to compete with. Now, bad is in quotes because I don't necessarily look at anything in nature as bad because they're just, these are unbeneficial microbes for the purpose of what we want to use them for. So if you see a plant that is, uh, that's got fungus on it, uh, yeah, you don't want it on there because, you know, it's, it's trying to do its job, which is break down the plant. Obviously, the plant is beginning to, to become unhealthy for some reason. Maybe it's been way too humid out and uh, the fungus is growing and it's uh, attacking the plant. Or maybe there's just something wrong with the plant. But we want our plant to um, have all the beneficial microbes. So we uh, pour it in the soil and we spray it on the plant. I don't ever like to call it, I mean, I could walk into a forest and uh, it looks like a beautiful forest or I can see a garden. I can walk into a garden and it look, look, look like a beautiful garden, but I can see, I can see problems everywhere but it doesn't mean that it's a bad garden or that the forest is bad or that the grasslands or the meadows are bad it's they're still beautiful but every everything every living organism has a purpose and it will stay that way it will stay alive it's just that you want to outnumber the um, unbeneficial microbes and this here I'm showing you uh, and I can link to it in a video, but really you're already seeing it here. That is microbes, mostly bacteria from my brewing. It's not castings. There may be like very few castings in there, but these are all just like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, but mostly bacteria, but all right in here. And it's just a, it's a glob. It doesn't even stick to you. It's just very weird, but that's plant food. So castings, and worm and tea studies. <clears throat> it's been shown by universities such as Ohio State in the field studies and by gardeners like you and I that the tea along with the castings can significantly increase plant growth and crop yields. It's also beneficial in the short term, a season, and especially the long term over a period of seasons. Along with these great benefits comes a boost in the plant's immune system it's able to resist parasites like the infamous aphids, tomato cyst eelworms, and root knot nematodes. Plant. Plants produce certain hormones like the jasmonic hormone that insects find distasteful. It also helps it to resist diseases such as Pythium and Rhizoctonia. And this is all comes from a paper uh, published by Professor Clive Edwards at all Ohio State University and when sprayed on leaves or foliage the disease causing microbes are outnumbered it cannot populate to the levels of taking over a single plant the tea also aids the plant in creating the cuticle this waxy surface protects the leaves from severe elements drying out and reduces attacks by certain harmful microorganisms and insects this is one of my zucchini leaves. Very big, very healthy, no pests. There might be a little part right here that a bug ate. And it was like, yuck, I'm out of here. And went on to either another leaf or another plant or my neighbor's garden. Ha ha. Oh, poor guy. More benefits of warm tea. 
So that's what's so cool about, about our gardens, because you are the one who's ultimately in control. And you are the one who sets the stage for all life within your garden, from the plants down to the microbes, down to the roots, right where the microbes are. You can't control it if you don't understand it, though. That's why the focus isn't necessarily the plant, but it's the soil, too. If we can grow the soil right, then we'll most definitely grow the plant right, because soil is a living thing. And we should be feeding and growing our soil just as much as we do our plants. And there I am sitting on that cucumber fence. You can't see the cucumbers for the sunflowers. But we have zucchini here and squash. And we have watermelon and cantaloupe. That's it. And of course we're growing a lot of other things over here. And over here as well, but you can't see it. All right, so now we're going to talk about what I said we're going to talk about is the other form of worm tea, and that is to make an extract. Okay, so this is just another preferred way of making uh, the tea or the, or the compost. If you don't do worm farming, but you, but you compost, you know, without worms, then, you know, you can still make a compost tea or you can brew a compost tea. But this is the extract. Uh, that you end up with that you see in the bottles. You may be a little confused though as to what the difference is. This is the process that involves using mature castings. Compost or castings and it has to be mature. Okay, you've got to understand some beginners may not really understand what mature castings are but it's very important that you use mature castings. More important than if you're brewing it. The compost is placed in a container of aged or unchlorinated water or suspended in water by using a mesh bag or without a bag. The bag will not allow the compost through but allow beneficial microbes to pass through. The bag is dipped several times to allow the tiny particles or the nutrients and microbes through. This can be done for a period of five minutes to 24 hours and so on. If there remains an earthy smell, then the tea is beneficial. So you could pour this, you know, a little bit of this right here, straight into your plant, or you can strain it. Um, I think one of the best strainers around and still is today is a a nylon paint strainer but you can strain this this is I'm showing you here that it is uh, it's settled uh, the castings are down here and there's some particles particulates uh, floated up here and you can strain that and pour it into your house plants okay so uh, and if it smells bad the reason why there's a cap on it so you can kind of gently shake it, shake it, not stirred, as they say. You don't want to vigorously shake it, but you gently shake it, kind of loosen the uh, nutrients and the microbes, and they get locked up in here in a, in a colloidal form or down here when you strain it. So this is uh, not as potent as brewing warm tea because the warm tea is like millions of Olympic um, professional Olympians, you know, they're just ready to go to work, they're pumped, they're full of energy, they're just ready to go. So I always uh, tell you to please brew the tea if you can. Okay, here's warm tea application results on our, uh, there's watermelon back here and then there's uh, our cantaloupe here, here's the picking of a couple cantaloupe. Here's my lazy tea applicator. I'm sipping on my little sippy cup and I'm just being real lazy on my grapes. Okay, so <clears throat> I started with a simple pump and bucket setup. And you can still receive, uh, get these results from a simple pump and bucket setup. Don't let anybody tell you different. But my results were almost immediate. It was like overnight. On one of my uh, web pages, I have a, 
um, a spinach where you can tell the difference overnight from uh, an application. I had healthy pest resistant plants, high yields, and large fruit just from this right here. Okay, so now all that being said, I'm going to talk about some people. <clears throat> And these are what I call pioneers, settlers, and heroes. Okay, so I do not want you to get all of your information from me. I am not your end-all, be-all, go-to source. Okay, I'm one perspective. And I st state that in the website, books, and videos. You need to get a wide perspective so you know what's best from you. Although you've got to know who's out there, who can you trust. There's a lot of people trying to make a buck. Okay, so let's talk about our pioneers, what I call pioneers. These people are no longer alive. Charles Darwin, of course, he was the very first. Uh, he was a British naturalist, but he called the worms uh, the intestines of the earth. And it's very true, as we discussed. It's, it's so true. Um, Clive Edwards at Ohio State University, an entomologist. He was 25 years as principal scientific officer at Rothamsted Experimental Station in Harpenden, England. 23 years as professor at Ohio State University. Wrote and co-edited Vermiculture Technology. It's hundreds of pages, very nerdy, about 60 bucks, but probably I think it's over 100 for the hardback. He published over 450 scientific papers and book and chapters. So along with that, uh, he had some co-editors and people that also uh, co-edited some, pub co some publications, with, which was James Metzger. Uh, he has a PhD and uh, he's still alive, uh, but he's one of the pioneers of See, PhD in horticulture and crop science. Norman Aaron Kahn, he's still alive. Uh, he co-edited with Clive Edwards. He's a professor at University of, I think it's University of Hawaii. Verma, he majored in vermicompost, sustainable agriculture, and soil ecology. Rhonda Sherman, she is totally alive today, and she helped uh, co-edit with uh, Clive Edwards. She's an extension specialist at North Carolina State University. More about her. Mary Applehoff. She was considered the uh, worm woman. Uh, 1936 to 2005, RIP Mary. She was a pioneer. She was an American biologist, environmentalist, and vermicomposter. She graduated from Michigan State University and most popular for Worms Eat My Garbage in 1982. She's still influential in the field of vermicomposting. She was such an advocate for worms and their role in the environment, and I read her book twice, Worms Eat My Garbage, and it's been updated since then. Uh, one of her friends, who I think is nicknamed the Worm Woman 2.0, and um, if you purchase my uh, presentation here, I go into a little bit more about Worm, worm Woman, woman 2.0 and Mary Applehoff. Um, anyway, and her books, uh, her book today is good because of one reason. Worms don't change. They're the same today as they were back then, as they were since Charles Darwin, as they were way before him. They don't change. The only thing that changes is our techniques and some of the uh, systems that we have today. Some, some of these books, though, they're not in color. They're just, uh, they're a little shorter than the Worm Farming Revolution and uh, not, not quite as um, lengthy. Now, our settlers are Rhonda Sherman. You see over, over here uh, where she, she helped co-edit with uh, Clive Edwards. Um, she's North Carolina University Extension Specialist in the Department of Hort Horticultural Science. 
She wrote the Worm Farmer's Handbook, which you can still buy. Um, matter of fact, it's not really that old. I think it came a little bit. It came out a little bit after my book did, uh, the Worm Farming Revolution. And she hosts the International Vermiculture Conference, and she's been doing it over 21 years. I think this will be the 23rd year here in 2023. Um, but that's a conference that she holds. Uh, she's very influential. And uh, again, if you buy this Worm Farming presentation, I have links to her. You can, you can uh, look her up and go to the North Carolina University and just look at the publications that she, she's written. Get her book. Uh, she's very well versed in um, vermiculture. Bentley Christie has a website, Red Worm Composting. He's in my book. I talk a lot about him. Uh, we do an interview with him. Very knowledgeable. He's been around uh, since before he had a website out before I did, before 2010. But a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Heather Rinaldi, she uh, owns TexasWormRanch.com, and she is extremely knowledgeable, have her own uh, ranch that she grows worms. And down here below, John uh, Kohler. Everybody knows John Kohler by now. He, he's uh, GrowingYourGreens.com, and he talks about uh, he interviews Heather, and he says, I think this is probably the best worm farm I have ever seen. And uh, she's very knowledgeable. Heather is. John Kohler is very great in what he does and going around and showing you different perspectives like a, a good Stuart would. Uh, Larry Shire, uh, he's also in my book. We interview him due to the blue worms, and that's why he started bluewormbin.com because there was such a misunderstanding about blue worms, but they are. Most people don't uh, buy them on purpose. Sometimes they'll get them by mistake. And uh, that's when Larry decided to, like, you know, like, people need to know about this. Uh, Melissa Carici, Carici from letterrot.org, Worm Farm and Community Compost. And she completed the North Carolina compost, compost uh, program that um, Rhonda um, had going on. And she opened up Let It Rot. A, uh, like I said, she's in my book. But she opened up a service where people can bring her food, kitchen scraps. She'll compost it. She'll grow worms. And she'll grow... Uh, She'll sell the castings, and uh, it's very successful. Samantha Flowers, uh, she owns Memes Worms, and there'll be a link below to probably everybody here, but there will be a link below um, to Samantha Flowers. You can get worms, because if you get, she's a worm farmer, and she grows worms and sells them. So if you get Worms, through that link below, I will send you a book or, or two. So you'll get that for free. You'll get an ebook. Um, and then there's Will's Worms. These, this is a worm farm run by kids. And uh, the LA Times called me up and they said, Do you know anything about this? I think it was 2020 or 2021. Do you know anything about this worm shortage here in California? I said, no, I don't, but I think I know who does. And I pointed her towards uh, two Will's worms. And then uh, they landed a page on the LA Times. These are kids. These are kids. And if kids can do it, and Samantha Flowers, she's a grandma. If she can do it, I'm a grandpa. If I can do it, if, if kids all the way up to grand, grandmas and grandpas can do it, you can too. And Dr. Elaine Ingham, I don't know her personally, but she's a soil food web microbiologist and recognized as the world's foremost soil biologist. She's a pioneer and she's a settler, in my opinion. And she may even be a hero to uh, a lot of people. And some of these people are my heroes, okay? Uh, I won't say who, because I kind of like to reserve that for whoever 
you know, thanks here. I think, you know, if you're into worm farming and you do it, you're, you're a hero in my book. But um, a lot of these people here that I talk about, I don't agree with them on 100% of everything. They don't agree with me on 100% of everything. And that is a healthy relationship because iron sharpens iron, right? And that's what you want. I don't want you to agree with me on everything. No, I, I'm not going to agree with you on everything because here's where, you know, the healthy debate starts. And uh, that's why I'm presenting these people to you so that you can get different perspectives and not agree with me on everything because you may do something that I show you how to do and then it didn't work for you and now all of a sudden you're upset with me and you know I don't want that because I want there to be many options for you so um and you shouldn't agree with anybody on 100 percent on anything on any industry because then that just means that you're not your own thinker and you need to be your own thinker especially through your own failures Okay, so a little more about me, and uh, this is an excerpt from Brown Thumb, Green Thumb, but it's kind of like what I said earlier, you know, I, I want to make it clear that I don't hold any degrees in horticulture, agriculture, or, or any culture, no degrees in any of any culture. I'm self-taught by the one who created nature, and I generally only grow food for my family, friends, and the needy. I'm always as open and honest as I know how to be. Always try to over-deliver over and put my money where my mouth is. My work has not been peer-reviewed in the world of academia. I didn't send this, book to, uh, this presentation or any of my books to anyone for their approval, forward, or critiques before publishing. I'm not trying to be witty about who I want to be accepted by, neither am I asking for anyone's approval. Whether growers, composters, or recyclers dislike or apply the information in this presentation will not affect me, my methods, or my garden. It, would, it will only affect their outcomes of working with or without nature. That's why I'm sharing it with you. So I hope you can get something from it. However, I do hope that, that they gain and that you gain an appreciation and a new perspective from nature. I'm only sharing what I know and what I've learned from nature along with quotes from some that do hold degrees, as I mentioned earlier. The fact is I, I am my biggest critic. And I think most of us would probably say the same thing too. If our biggest critic is failure, then I've been critiqued way too many times. But this is how we succeed, right? Right? I want my success to be your success. I guess if failure can be a critic, then success can be a peer. If this is true, then say hello to some of my amazing peers. Sunflowers, green foliage, bright flowers and fruits. Here's the uh, cucumbers and this is one, that's the one that didn't get away. Broad leaves and fat roots and with spinach and carrots, tomatoes, cucumbers, the never-ending plant growth, health and yields, the gift that keeps on giving. Living healthier and happier all because of one little critter, the worm. They're one of the most undesirable, misunderstood, lowly and forgotten beneficial creatures on the planet. They are a national treasure. They're a secret treasure. Man has reinvented the wheel out of power, greed, and fear with synthetic chemicals. The secret treasure to a healthy and happy life is buried in only a few inches of soil. The Creator made it easy for us. All we need to do is remember the knowledge of the past infused with the technology of today that will help sustain a healthier tomorrow. Or else, the future one day could look like this. Warning. Drug and Food Association. Air quotes. I changed that around. Because no, there's no program I know that exists that's called that. These are gardening guidelines. That's right. Gardening doesn't have to be dangerous. Practice 
safe gardening when using chemicals. Always suit up and use the buddy system because the life you save could be your own or the one you love. <laughs> of course, this is only meant as a joke. <laughs> or is it? So there's a great article that I wrote uh, that explains a lot about the history of chemical fertilizer, and it's about a 40-page book. So if you want to know, <clears throat> a lot of people will say, well, chemical fertilizers, they're okay. Nitrogen's okay because it was just extracted from the air. Well, I went straight to the horse's mouth and said, and asked and looked, said, do you extract, nitrog extract nitrogen from the air? And the answer I got was no, because it's already in the fossil fuels. Because since they're using the fossil fuels to heat up the big stack and extract the nitrogen, they also have to uh, use the fossil fuels to be able to, you know, get that nitrogen from the air. So uh, that's bogus. They get their nitrogen and uh, ammonia from fossil fuels. So final thoughts. We must go from synthetic thinking to organic doing. Harnessing the power of one of the most forgiving creatures in the world is already revolutionizing the gardening community and one day will change the direction of commercial farming as we know it. Hopefully we'll see the demise of synthetic chemicals in our lifetime and an end to the pain and suffering they caused, but only if we stand up and do something. Worm composting and its effects is still in its infancy stage, but can be found in grocery stores, coffee shops, convenience stores, fast food, restaurants, schools. I know a lot of people that have uh, talked with that are implementing programs in their schools, prisons. I have a lady on my website she, with, uh, with some pictures on there. She's, she has a program for the prisoners and teaches uh, some of those that are, that are in detention about composting. It's, it's pretty awesome. Airports, military bases, paper mills, hospitals, assisted living centers, community food drive organization, organizations, churches, bakeries, food preparation companies, and wherever you decide to introduce it. This is a revolutionary phenomenon sweeping the globe. It's another huge domino falling because we've discovered that worms can multitask in areas of growing and enriching soil, growing healthy plants, provide pet food, recycle waste from food and municipal industries, ignite the fishing and bait industry, ignite the garden, gardening and, com and community, and create small worm companies to sell worms castings, produce, and tea, creating a profit while also creating a well-deserved respect within their own community. And maybe that community will consider you a hero as well. So it's time for us to stop waiting for answers to come. The answers lie not in man's ability or our uh, inventions to recreate but in the restoration of the Creator's simplest of creatures. Let's not ever forget that our roots of responsibility and stewardship run deep in restoring our land back to an arable state for our children and grandchildren. And you can see the effects of worms and castings. Isn't it beautiful? Um, so is the uh, rosebush. Let this generation not become the generation of acquiescence and apathy, but of honesty and integrity. Because at the end of the day, it's not enough to only say something, but rather say, we did something. I don't want to tell my kids and my grandkids that I just talked about it and shook my head. I want to say, no, I actually stood up and I did something. The restoration to the founding principles is already here. The revolution has already begun. And even in 2020, the revolution, in my opinion, has kind of come to an end. And then people's eyes were open in 2020. An awakening began. 
And <clears throat> now we are, we've arrived here at 2023 and it's like, we don't even know what is going to happen. You know, we're all bracing, but you know, the thing to do is to start doing something and get in and start getting dirty and start learning now because now is the time to start if you haven't yet. And a great place to start is to go out and support a local worm farmer today. I've got a link below where you can click on it, like I said, and you can get worms or you can find maybe worms in your area from, from somebody that's selling them. If you are a worm farmer and you sell worms, then maybe you want to list on my uh, web page. Here are some more results from applying the worm castings in tea. And remember that some of these are from just the simple pump and bucket setup for using uh, worm tea or in brewing worm tea. Yep, you got it. There I am. Swiss chard, tomatoes, cucumbers, sunflowers, watermelon, zucchini, and peppers. This is a really small harvest. And that was a small har harvest, but I mean, you don't find these in stores. They're tiny. They're tiny in stores. Whoops. All right. So one of the big reasons why I garden and have worms and stuff is not only is gardening fulfilling and physically healthy, but equally mentally healing. I, you know, I, I, I just can't stress that enough that getting out in the garden and being productive at it is a great exercise, but also for the mind and for the soul. I cannot tell you enough. You just have to experience it. And then you just, you'll, you find out from yourself. Okay, so this concludes our presentation. I know it was long, but this is basically the uh, highlights of highlights of highlights of everything that I've written and um, why I do what I do. And this is why that you ought to be uh, also getting into worm composting, uh, culturing worms and, and getting the castings and growing uh, naturally because you don't know what's in the food you buy today. It's just the only person you can really trust is yourself. You know, once you start reading the, the ingredients, you can read what's in there, but once you get to natural flavors and artificial flavors, the list can be a mile long. You won't know unless you actually call, and then you still can't get an answer from them. And I do that. I call them. I find out, hey, what's in uh, this and what's in that? And they're like, well, we can't tell you. It's proprietary. But they can tell you, like, if you ask, well, are there nuts in it? Like, no, there's no nuts. There's no soy. There's no, you know, pork. There's no whatever. You know, it's, it's like pulling teeth because those, you know, natural flavors and artificial flavors, you just don't know. It can be a mile long. Start, do, start getting to this and the time is now. Oh, before I end, one thing that I said that I would mention is that if, the reason why that I use uh, the worm factory and then the urban worm bag. I use the worm factory for uh, brewing my tea because I'll go in and I'll grab the castings from the bottom tray because I know exactly how fresh it is or how old it is and it's generally 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 right around one month and that's about as fresh as fresh can be with the urban worm bag I can reach up and I can grab some castings but it because it's been sitting there and not harvested um, it's it can be kind of mixed in with um, the rest of the decomposing matter and things that are trickling down into it. Uh, now, it's not really an issue. It's just my preference. What I like about the worm factory or a tray through, a flow through tray system, is that you can just take everything off, look at that bottom tray, sift through it, and there may be some worms, there may be some cocoons, 
but that's okay. You can go in and put it in your nylon paint strainer, uh, worms and everything, because your water is uh, full of oxygen. They're not going to die on you. Uh, when you're done brewing, you take it out and you can put it back in your um, worm factory, your static bin, your urban worm bag, or any any type of worm system that you have. And it'll go back in and it'll uh, re go back into refining, recycle, repurpose, uh, be... Uh, regenerated again but it, it just you know the worms work it through again and uh, next time you're ready to brew you can pull some more out but when I want to use the urban worm bag uh, for plants and stuff that's what I do I'll, I'll grab uh, from the bottom I'll, I'll rake it from the bottom and then use the castings and use it in my seeds and transplants um, or out in the greenhouse uh, so and then maybe some for uh, house plants but um, those are the the two uh, uses for those two types of system systems one is it just for generating a lot of uh, castings uh, and growing my worm squirm even uh, larger which is the urban worm bag and then uh, the worm factory generally generally for tea but that's me. There's so many different uh, uses for it. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I told you that. Okay. This concludes uh, the worm farming presentation. Uh, thank you to my little sidekick there, Hermie. And if you want this for your own, then I'm going to have a video that uh, will explain that where that you can get uh, the same presentation. So that's it. I'll see you later.